talk to myself a lot. And most of the time, not most of the time, some of the time, it's in my head. Some of the time, it's out loud. I don't really realize I'm doing it until I'm already talking out loud. And it's it can be embarrassing when I'm around other people and not really realizing it until it's already happening. And I don't know if that's normal. <laughs> What is going on? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. We are recording this um, the day after we got back to the office after being um, gone for the holiday break. So we're into the new year. If you're listening to this, it's what, February already? Or at the end of January? Yeah, January 22nd. Good. So I hope you're still staying on all these new things you were going to do. The new year, new year, whatever's going on. Or if you're like me, I really struggled this year. Like, I wasn't ready for the new year. Wasn't super jazzed about it. And now that it's gotten going, we're at the very beginning of the new Now I'm starting to get into the groove and starting to imagine, all right, here's some things that are going to be different. Here's some things that are going to be the same I'm going to double down on. Here's some things I'm going to quit doing. So I'm pretty excited about it. And Kelly? Yes. Jenna had her baby. Yes. So um, I think everybody knows that Jenna was pregnant, and uh, she was due in late f- mid to late February. This show would have been way funnier if you had just said, like, we didn't know she was pregnant and she had a baby. But all right. Everybody knew. So the things you're going to stop doing are not those things, okay. apparently, right? Correct. Okay. Just check it. <laughs> uh, wanted to check on that. So no, she had her baby, and um, she ended up, the day after Christmas, having to go in the hospital. She had preeclampsia, mm-hmm. but she is fine. Baby's fine. He's tiny. Yep. Little, uh, almost four pounds. A little peanut. His name is Owen, but uh, he is healthy. I got screwed again. Didn't name it John like we had planned. No, she did not. Um, it's you know, well, we'll call it like all the drugs and stuff. That's probably how that happened. That, that she named it something different. I agree. Surely, once all the hormones and stuff, she'll figure She'd that be like, out. Oh my gosh, what have we done? Change the certificate. Yeah, Change exactly. It. Change everything. Yeah. Probably Golly. what will happen. Um, Probably. <laughs> but no, she's she's home. She came home yesterday. I saw her last night. And the baby's in the NICU, but he'll be there for a couple weeks. But he is very healthy. Yeah. Um, just needs a little little growing. He's just a little tiny peanut. Some more, some more warmth. Yeah, a little warmth. Uh, he's in there. He's sun tanning right now. Yes. Just uh, baking. Just, yep. Doing a little baking, a little growing. But he's, he's actually really healthy. And um, yeah. I've so, heard this is the nightmare part for folks whose baby is in NICU for a while. You can't hold your own baby. And yeah. it's just absolute total hell. She's she's met him. Uh, it will be like she didn't meet him until the next day, like officially see him. Yeah. She's held his hands, but she hasn't held him yet. <sighs> um, but she did tell me when she had to leave the hospital yesterday, she was crying. Oh, I can't But imagine. she said the NICU nurses, I mean, those are just, man. Yeah, they're special. They people. are special. And they told her anytime, two in the morning, five in the afternoon, eight at night, whatever, you need to see him, you come up. Yeah. You know, there's no visiting hours. There's none of that. That um, with NICU parents, anytime you need to come in here, you come in here. And they're only like three miles from the hospital. Yeah. So that's great. So, but he'll just be there a couple weeks. Um, so she's doing good. And she misses everybody. And, you know, it was not what she said last night. She said, I'm still trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> she said, I went to my appointment on the day after Christmas. And, you know, for a baby that wouldn't do for two months. And then hey, oh. I have one. And so she's. And she should go back to your house, but the baby's still there. Yeah. So her head's a little, you know, um, has spun a little bit, but but they're doing good. What a wild world we live in. Yes. Well, very cool that we live in this little weird sliver of history where that's possible. But in the meantime, we're welcoming Taylor to the game. Taylor. To our little game. Swift, by the way. Taylor Swift. She's taking a break from her tour. She's going to be on the greatest pod show of all, podcast of all time. Pod yes, show. Pod Said show. the oldest guy wow. ever. Wow. <laughs> I don't feel as old anymore. I'm so old. All right. Let's go out to Ontario, Canada and talk to Jesse's girl. What's up, Jesse? Hey, Dr. John. How you doing? We're doing all right, man. How about you? I'm doing okay. Very good, man. What's happening? Is it cold? You know what? It snowed a little bit last night for the first time. We had a, we had a white Christmas, actually. Ah, very good, man. It was, Congratulations. Yeah, it was quite warm. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was good. What's up? Uh, all right. Well, I've been uh, really struggling with some anxieties that I've never really experienced before. Um, not not really sure where to go with it, but I know I don't want to feel like that anymore. Um, I'll give you a quick backstory on it. I was married for 20 years. I'm, I'm a Christian man. Uh, my ex-wife just kind of abruptly up and left. She had her own kind of mental health issues that she was dealing with and some past traumas, et cetera. And, uh, 
So yeah, there was about a three day notice and then poof, everything had changed. And, and this anxiety that I felt was, I mean, I got through it. That was five years ago. And, uh, you know, I kind of held on to hope that, you know, things were going to work out and be patient about it. And, uh, you know, again, my faith played a large role in that. And, you know, I was, I was pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled and kicked to the curb. And finally I said, enough's enough. I ventured out, I met a wonderful girl. Everything was great seeing for about four months. And then I started to feel her pull away. And I, I thought I had dealt with all those anxieties. And the, this, the minute she started to pull away, I was hyper aware of every single text message the tone of her voice, body language. I, I felt like I did the first day my wife left. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been a week of, of just that, just that, that pit in my stomach. And I, I, I need to, I need to not feel like that. Okay. Um, anytime somebody says that after 20 years, somebody abruptly left, I always want to push on that a little bit. When she, when she, when your ex-wife tells you, and, and I'm, I'm going back that far for a reason, okay? So I'm not just, just playing around. Um, when she told you why she left, did she paint a picture of a long story? Or is it really like, now I woke up on Tuesday and decided I'm good? Uh, well, the funny answer to that is um, she never really told me why. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it, 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 it took about two and a half years for her to, to kind of pinpoint to herself, uh, why. And, and, and I guess that came down to, she did say she wasn't happy for a while. Okay. Um, there was a lot of outside stressors outside of our marriage, not saying that I didn't have anything to do with, you know, definitely could have been more supportive, more involved, that kind of thing. Outside not, stressors uh, like what? Uh, she has a daughter who has uh, been struggling with a drug addiction and, um, you know, we had custody of grandkids at the time that was, um, our child services up in Canada basically dumped them off at the house and said, if you guys don't take them, they're going to get separated and they're going to go somewhere else. So it was, uh, yeah. So did she take, did she take those kids with her? We did. Yes. No, no, no. Uh, When she left you. Oh. Uh, no, uh, by the time the actual split happened, uh, things had kind of worked out there and the children were returned back to them, to, uh, to the mother. Okay. Here's what I'm getting at. Um, I don't want you to look at anxiety as something that you worked through. Okay. Mm -hmm. It serves an important role in your life. It just has to serve the right role. Okay. So, um, we all have a friend or hopefully you have a friend who would (laughs) like, if y'all were out having a drink or something and somebody mouthed off at your wife, this friend would be hitting that person before you even realize what had happened. Right. Mm -hmm. We all want a friend that defends us. And then there's that idiot friend who defends us like that when we don't need it or don't want it. And it causes like a big melee. Right. Similarly, anxiety works for us. It just doesn't always work in the right place at the right time. If you told me after 20 years, two decades of building a life with somebody, you all took on foster kids, you took on an external, I mean, you took on somebody else's daughter and raised them as your, raised her as your own and dealt with all the mental health and addiction challenges, all that stuff. And then one day someone just, she just leaves. That would shake the sidewalk. That would shake the, the foundation of your life, like to where your feet wouldn't ever feel secure. Mm-hmm. And so then you meet yeah. somebody after five years, and it sounds like you and your ex are still talking throughout this, like, f- even though y'all have been divorced for five years now, y'all still are in communication. Is that right? Well, there's a little bit more of that story. Huh? Um I, I can let you finish your, your thought well, there. Go I, for it. Go ahead and fill me in. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, uh, um, you know, my, my ex was always around. She was always kind of kept me at arm's distance and she's been clear that, you know, she has a hard time seeing a life without me. And, uh, I kind of had to come to the point and say like, look, you know, I, I, I can't be your friend. I could be friendly, but I need to, 
this isn't going anywhere. This isn't going to get fixed, et cetera. And, what did she accomplish then, by divorcing you? Uh, did she want to sleep with other people? Did she just want to live in her own house? Like, what was she going for? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. She did get involved with, uh, another guy, you know, within a couple of weeks after, okay. All right. uh, so, about, three, about three weeks after leaving. Yeah. So, so there was somebody uh, else and then it was going to fix everything and then it didn't. And then all of a sudden yeah, you realized yeah, what she lost. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, fast forward to, so when I sent in my submission originally, um, you know, my biggest concern was just feeling that anxiety from my new partner pulling away from me. Well, fast forward, you know, a week, um, that partner, uh, you know, said that it's not fair how she's treating me. She's distant and cold. She has a lot of stuff going on. It is what it is. Um, that put me into this, again, that spiral of anxiety. Uh, and then just last night, my ex-wife reaches out, out of the blue saying that she's made a terrible mistake and, <laughs> so right. that's that's a whole nother whole nother thing but um so here's the deal the yeah. the, the anxiety's right it remembered think of it as a gps pin your body put a gps pin in the moment that the woman you were married to after 20 years up and left you mm. it also put a gps pin in you didn't know what do you do for a living police officer oh my gosh of <laughs> God, dude, lead with that, man. So a guy who knows everything and shows up to the worst, no one calls you because they're having a great day. No. And you go and you have to solve these problems. You have to know what to do next. And you now have to know what to do next in very tense, uncomfortable situations that are being filmed and broadcast all over the world 24-7, 365. Yeah. And you missed it in your own house. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Your body puts a GPS pin in something really scary, which is Jesse no longer trusts Jesse. Huh. And then you meet somebody new. And your body is like, man, this feels good. This is like a real human being. She's beautiful. She laughs. She's funny. And then it is hyper aware to take care of you, to love you. Mm -hmm. Your body's doing its job when she starts to pull away. She takes a little bit longer to respond to that text. You know, I don't know if you've been to, to Detective Academy, but one of the things they teach you in Detective Academy is walk into a room and exhale first and see if you can feel something that doesn't look right, doesn't feel right. Your body's doing that for you 24-7, 365. So I think the anxiety you feel is right on. I would be worried about you if this had happened and you were like, all right, cool, on to the next I would be like, man, you should probably go talk to somebody. <laughs> Fair enough. The challenge for you is twofold. One, don't instantly try to make that anxiety go away. Which, getting back with your ex-wife tonight, because it, she would be warm and she'd be comfortable, would make that anxiety go away today. And it, you'll wake up tomorrow, dude, and it will be back with a vengeance. And you know that. I do, yeah. So head into the anxiety, feel it. Let, it, let it be a part of you. That sounds, that sounds terrible. It is, but Hey, it's like, <laughs> dude, you don't go to the gym and take all the weight off the bar. You go to the gym and put on as heavy as you could possibly lift. Why? Cause there's strength on the other side of that. And it sucks. It's not fun. Mm. So when your body's trying to get your attention, head towards, you do this for, for a living, man. You run to the fire. You run at the shots. And when no every, anxiety there whatsoever. No, because you've trained it a thousand million billion times. And you trust your training. Uh, and, you, and you trust your uh, you trust your partners. But you don't trust Jesse anymore. Wow. Fair? Yeah. So here's what I want you to do with it, Okay. Um, one, I want you to hang on the line. I'm going to send you a free copy. I'll mail it up there to Canada for you of, of my new building a non-anxious life book. Okay. I'm going to send that to you. It, it, it's got a roadmap to it. The second thing is Perfect. I want you to begin to write down and every police officer I know from my dad to my friends, everyone I know, all the guys done patrol with, they carry those little black notebooks. I want you to get a separate one just for you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to write down when you start feeling anxious. She hasn't, she's not responding to my text. She's not doing this. She's not doing that. I'm doing it. I want you to write that crap down and get it out of your body. 
Okay. Later on at night, later on in the afternoon, when you get done working out, it's almost always better to do something physical before you start reviewing stuff because your body state changes. But I want you to go to the gym, go for your walk, go for your exercise, get off shift, whatever you need to do. And I want you just to take 30 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, look at that list you've written for the day and say, is this true? Is this true? Okay. Is she really avoiding me? Maybe, or maybe she had diarrhea when you texted, man. And she just, I, I made that weird. I'm sorry. But like, maybe no, she, no, had, it's, it's good. she had diarrhea and she just didn't have her phone with her. Thank God. I don't want to, you don't want to date somebody that has their phone with them while they have diarrhea. So like, maybe that's what happened. Or maybe, nope, this is a pattern. This is a pattern. And yeah, we need to have a hard conversation. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm with you. And here's the last thing I want you to do. I want you to be really, really, really honest with yourself. I have been unable to be honest with myself in this way without talking to somebody else. So, yes, I'm recommending that all of my police officer friends um, see a counselor, have some sort of person. I also recommend that if you can find somebody that's not in your precinct, that's not like, yeah, go talk to, man, that's tough stuff because they got to keep notes. But you can go find somebody off the off the path. And obviously if you need to get help, get help from wherever you need to get help from. Right. Um, and it's very precinct specific as to what kind of care they provide. But once you go talk to somebody, have somebody that you can process this, this one important fact, what did I contribute in my first marriage? Cause part of rebuilding trust with Jesse is owning reality, being honest with yourself, man. I actually was married to my job more than I was married to my wife. I actually got home. And after being the person that everyone in the neighborhood called, I also treated my wife like she was one of the callers. Well, you need to do this. You need to do this. I often fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. What world did I create for my wife that ultimately she was like, I'm out. And dude, maybe nothing. But very rarely is it nothing. I'm confident you contributed something to that environment, to that world. And be honest about the signs that you missed. And here's what we're doing. We're letting our body know I'm driving again. I'm back in the driver's seat of my own life. This is building a non-anxious life, but this is dealing with anxiety. Don't run from it. Take those ruminating thoughts, write them down, get them out of your head. And then be really honest and reflective. When you start owning reality, choose reality. What role did I play in this thing? And as you head into new relationships, man... Knock your lights out. And by the way, to answer your, your last question, your kind of sidebar question, I don't have a problem with it if you decide to get married again. But go real, real slow. Really, really slow. And don't use your ex-wife as a Xanax to not feel so anxious anymore. She didn't deserve that, and you don't either. Go slow. I'm grateful for you, brother. Thanks for your service, my man. Every day, you're out there for us. Grateful for you. We'll be right back. I'm always on the lookout for supplements, food, and top-of-the-line products that enhance your immune system, improve emotional and mental health, vastly improve your digestion, and I'm always looking for ways I can improve my sleep and clarity of thought. Listen, I'm always trying different supplements, foods, powders, and potions, and recently, without the company knowing, I purchased some of their products with my own money, and I was blown away by the results. I reached out to them, and I'm super excited that Organifi is partnering with me on this podcast to change my life and yours. Simply put, Organifi is wellness made easy. Organifi makes nutrition delicious for everybody. Organifi makes the cleanest products available on the market, and me and my kids personally take multiple Organifi products every single day. My life has changed for the better. From what I think are the best tasting green powders on the market, red powders that I can mix with water for caffeine-free energy that doesn't leave me shaking like a salt shaker, gold powders to help me wind down and sleep, immunity, protein, magnesium, and a special kids line and more, Organifi takes all the drama and guesswork out of nutrition, supplements, immunity support, and cognitive enhancement, and it puts it all in one place for you and your entire family. Y'all know I like to experiment and take lots of different supplements, but if I had to answer the question, if I only had one supplement I could take, what would it be? I'd start with Organifi. Invest in your health in this new year so you can show up for your spouse, your kids, your work, and your community. We need you. 
Go to Organifi.com backslash Deloney or use promo code Deloney at checkout for a 20% discount for all the Dr. John Deloney Show listeners. That's Organifi.com slash Deloney. All right, let's go out to Tampa, Florida and talk to Emily. What's up, Emily? Hi, Dr. John. I'm doing well. Awesome. What's happening? What's up? Yeah, so my question is, how do I begin to enjoy my life outside of work, essentially? Usually that has to do with um, a life outside of work that you don't enjoy. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, so some context, um, I'm a teacher and I work, I mean, probably at least 60 hours a week doing that. And then I do some volunteer work and then I'm getting my um, education master's degree. And so I'm just, I'm just kind of always on the go. And then when I get home, I'm married and, you know, I do have a happy marriage. Of course it has its ups and downs, but when I get home, I don't intend to feel this way, but I kind of just feel a sense of just bleh. Like I feel kind of hopeless and I don't enjoy anything. <laughs> um, and it's not that I am looking to go back to work, but when I'm at work, I don't feel that way essentially. Does it have to do with the fact that when you go to work as a teacher, which is what I've been, I've spent my whole career doing that. There's always going to be outliers, right? There's outliers in every job. There's goofballs in every job. But on the whole, you go to work with a group of people who have a shared sense of purpose. We're going to change the lives of these kids. Sometimes it's, we're going to provide these kids a safe place to go. Sometimes it's, we're going to teach these kids and push them really hard because we think they're capable of more than they are. But you have a shared sense of optimism and we're going to take X and we're going to walk alongside people until it becomes Y. And then you go home and you don't, you don't share that same sense of, I've got a partner in here. We're working on the thing together and we're creating something amazing and we're creating, like it's X and we're creating Y. And so you get home and you just go, Bleh. am I right or well, wrong? I could be wrong. You're, no, you're completely right. That's not something I had ever thought about. Um, my husband, he doesn't, he, right now he's actually not working at all, but um, why? I, so he, I, I, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot this month at first. I was very frustrated with him because I felt like he wasn't driven, right? He didn't, he wasn't interested in working. Um, but he, I've, I've realized now I think he's actually struggling from some kind of depression. Um, cause even applying for jobs was very difficult for him. And I kind of, uh, took the lead on that. And now that he's gotten offered interviews, he's gotten a little bit more driven about it. Um, yeah, so I think there's something mentally going on there. Um, uh, but I, I, I'm yeah, going to go say ahead. this, and I mean it with all due respect in my soul, and I'm trying to be kind and loving. I don't mm -hmm. care. He's got to get a job. Yeah. The damning nature of low-level dysthymia that, oh, this sucks. I got fired or I got laid off or whatever. Did he quit or did he get fired? What happened? He did get, he did quit. He was kind of miserable in his last job. So okay. He did quit. So yeah. there's just, you sit at home and you wait for motivation. Mm -hmm. You wait for the perfect thing. And it doesn't exist. You have to go manufacture it. And you manufacture it yeah. by go get a job. Yeah. And you don't quit a job unless you have another job. I don't care how miserable it is. You, 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 yeah. you, even if it's, Hey, I'm quitting the six figure job and I got a job sack and groceries. Cause I got to do something to contribute mm -hmm. both for my psychology and my physiology. And for the, like, we got to have money in this account. Um, but it becomes this, this spiral that's really hard to get out of. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. The alternative, I mean, the, the fantasy on the other side of that is my life will be so much better if, with not this. Mm -hmm. And then you get home and blech. And then it's, well, it will only be good if it will only be good if, and I'm not good. Enough. And it turns into this mm -hmm. just poison. Yeah. And here's what happens. You lose respect for your husband. Fair? Yeah. Just say it out loud. Yes. 
And I, and I know that's hard to say out loud because I know you love him. And I know he's a great guy. I'm not saying he's not a good guy. Okay. Right. But it's hard to be optimistic. It's hard to build something. It's hard to have hope. And hope is just this idea that tomorrow's going to be a little bit better than today or maybe a lot better than today. And it's hard to have hope when you don't have respect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And for a while, you know, um, you know, I get home and I feel like my husband, he's on his phone a lot, even whenever he's off of work. And that just really frustrates me. And so I think you're correct in that, you don't, know. Don't apologize for your but, frustration, Emily. Yeah. You should be frustrated. I'm frustrated for you. Yeah. If he called my show and said, my wife is really frustrated with me and I don't think it's fair. I quit my job because I just hated it. And now I sit at home waiting for the right thing. I would have a hard time being compassionate to him. Yeah. And I would tell him, go find a job today. Any kind of job. Mm -hmm. at, it, it, that's going to be the step forward to getting some sense in your body that, that um, uh, like you start standing on your own two feet again after being lost at sea. Yeah. Well, something I've learned in the last, you know, five years of marriage is I can't make him. <laughs> so what, what is your advice? How do I, you know, how do I help him? Um, I think there's a couple, you're exactly right. And the fact that you learned this in the first five years means you are way ahead of most marriages, which is awesome. It took me like 20 years to figure that out. Um, all right. Here's a couple of things. One, I want you to spend some time being very honest with Emily. And right now you have been spent a lot of time being a mother to your husband. And when you're a mom to your husband, I I'm going to say this. I know it sounds gross. I've gotten some flack in the past, but I don't care. It's true. No mom wants to have sex with their son. Mm -hmm. No mom wants to have intimate relations with their son outside of sex. Mm -hmm. No, um, you don't want to come home and have a third job or a fourth job after grad school and your service to your community and your never ending teaching job. Mm -hmm. And your fourth job is, is caring for this giant infant adult. And I'll go one step further. If he does have some significant depress depressive issues, those are real. Mm -hmm. And maybe this isn't the moment for him to get a job. This is the moment that he gets his butt into care. Yeah. Just sitting at home on your phone is a no-go. And so I want you to be honest for the first time in a long time with, I want you to write down in a notebook, I've lost respect for my husband because I saw him face adversity and I saw him bow out. Because mm -hmm. your body feels that. You got to be honest with yourself. Okay? And I think you have to stop apologizing for being frustrated. and Stop apologizing for feeling burnt out. You know what burnout is? It's when your body says, I quit because you're not getting the message. You're trying mm -hmm. to carry the load of two people at your home and trying to create a home with a guy who has no interest in creating a home. Yeah. Right? That's a hard stop. Mm -hmm. And the second step here is after you're honest with yourself and you write some of these things down and you're probably going to shock yourself with what you write down because it's going to be hard. The next step is not to go bomb him with these things. That's not fair mm -hmm. to anybody. Okay. What is fair is you sitting at the table and saying the following. Here are the boundaries I'm drawing. Here's what I'm going to do moving forward. I am going to go see a counselor because I have a husband that refuses to get work. I am going to fill in the blank. If I come home and you have not applied for a single job today and you've sat here on your phone, I am going to take myself out to dinner. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? This is not mm -hmm. bombing him with, you need to do this, you need to do this, because that hasn't worked. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's you being very clear about here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to continue to work hard. I'm going to begin to eat a little healthier. I'm not going to wallow around and be mad at you and then be mad at myself for being mad at you. And the, that spiral, you know the spiral I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I live that yeah. all the time. <laughs> all right. I threw a lot at you. Tell me what you're feeling on the way back. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm feeling, um, 
I don't know. I feel like I'm I'm a little worried that it's nothing's going to change. <laughs> okay, but nothing's um, changing. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and, and as you're mentioning, I think these are great steps just to take care of me. Cause that's really all I can do. I know that. Um, and hopefully, yeah, hopefully he'll get the message, but yeah, we've had conversations before where, you know, I talk with him and we kind of go over plans that we had when we first got married and, and then it, by the end of it, I feel like we're in agreement. And then, you know, six months down the road, I look back and nothing's changed. <laughs> well, and um, have you sat down yeah. and said, I feel like you have not been honest with me. I feel unloved in this home. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? I love you and I always want to have sex with you and I've had four beers. What do you mean? And you can say, because we made some agreements. And yeah. you've chosen to not uphold your end of those agreements, which leaves me all alone. Yeah. And those are scary conversations because here's why. He might say, well, screw you, then I'm out. Mm -hmm. But right now he said, screw you, I'm in. Fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I guess the, (laughs) the, the hardest thing for you is you don't have an easy path forward. Yeah. You have a, I'm going to say nothing and just continue this thing on and hope he gets a job and hope it solves all his problems. It will not, Emily. Within six months, he's going to tell you he hates this job and it's killing him and the boss is an idiot and his coworkers are morons and he's going to quit. I'm telling you right now. Or you can have a really hard, hard series of conversations, not about what he needs to fix, but about what you're going to do. What do I do in the case that he, because sometimes he'll get really frustrated and say, you know, oh, all these things that I do for you, I thought, you know, you loved me. You Are you telling me that X, Y, and Z doesn't mean anything to you? Like he gets, he can get kind of defensive like that. What would you recommend I yeah, do? That's, that's, how, that's how children respond, right? Which is like, mm-hmm. well, then I'm taking my ball and going home. Here's what you can say. You can say, I hear that you've chosen to try to love me in ways that you like. That make mm-hmm. that you have chosen. I'm telling you what I need to feel loved in this home, in this marriage. Mm-hmm. Oh, so if I just make dinner for you. I never asked you to make dinner. That's a choice you made. I did ask mm-hmm. you to get a job. I did ask you if you're not working and you're just sitting here, that when we get home, the house is cleaned up and you're not just sitting there on your phone playing video games. Right? Because that, that mm-hmm. that's just all that is, is a look over here. Look over here, look over here, look over here. Mm-hmm. It's just a distraction. And here's, uh, guys do it a lot. Women do it too. But guys do it a lot with, oh, I'm working all day. It was when my wife told me, I'm not asking you to do that. Yeah. I'm asking you to be here with me. Because I had the opposite problem. I was working 24 hours a day, 365. Mm-hmm. It was the opposite issue. And when I would come at her with what your husband does, just the opposite. Oh, I do this and this and this. And she's like, dude, I never asked for any of that. I asked for you. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh crap, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to do that. And then it was me because I said I do. I had to go figure out the, that set of skills and I had to go learn it and figure it out. Similarly on the other side. Oh, I do this and this and this. That's not what I asked. I asked that we build something together and you said I do and you said I'm in and you're not. So here's what I'm going to do. But if somebody throws those little temper tantrum-y things, oh, you're just ungrateful. No, no, I'm talking about. It's just distraction. Just distraction. And you may have to walk away from the table and say, hey, I'm going to come back to this conversation. I'm going to come back in 30 minutes because right now um, you're acting, you're, you're, you're talking to me as though I'm seven and I'm not. I'm going to come back in 30 minutes. Let's, let's, let's reconvene. Whew. It's hard. I don't envy you. But to your husband, if he's listening, you have to get a job. You got to go work. And if you can't work, I know those people. I've sat with them. Fine. You got to go get help. You got to go see somebody. You got to go check yourself into an inpatient clinic. You have to do the work. Just sitting at home on your phone is not a solution, particularly while your wife is working 60 hours a week plus grad school, plus serving the community. 
enough. Be somebody worthy of being respected in your own home. Sure, quit a toxic job. I've had to do it. You've had to do it. Fine. But don't quit that job for nothing. For a couple of months with on the couch with a cell phone. No. Quit that job and go work at a coffee shop. Quit that job and start driving Uber that night. Quit that job and go sling boxes at Walmart on the overnight shift for $25 an hour tonight. And then apply for jobs when you're not sleeping. You can't think your way out of these things on a couch with a cell phone. Look around at our culture. We're drowning in. I'm just going to think my way out of this on a couch with a cell phone. You have to go do. Emily, thanks for the call. Call anytime. I have a feeling this these conversations get harder before they get better. I want you to be honest with yourself. You only have two hard choices moving forward. Hard to let things just be the same way they are and continually not respect this man-child that you're married to or decide, I'm Emily and I'm worth more than this. I'm worth being loved. I'm worth a home and a marriage that I can fight for, that I love. Whew. I'm going to have that hard conversation. Either way, your path forward is hard. I say take the one that's going to result in the possibility of healing and change. We'll be right back. I'm so excited that 8 Sleep is partnering with the Dr. John Deloney Show to take care of our listeners, you, and help you change your marriage and change your life. Our friends at 8 Sleep have created a fitted sheet with cooling and heating technology embedded inside called the 8 Sleep Pod. The pod cover can easily be added to your existing mattress like a fitted sheet for individualized temperature adjustments down to 55 degrees where normal people sleep all the way up to 110 degrees based on your environment and body temperature throughout the night. It cools down or warms up each side of your bed, and over time, it learns what your body needs, and it does it automatically. And in turn, it improves your sleep quality like you have to experience to believe it. The 8 Sleep Pod also has built-in vibration alarms that wake you up when it's time, and it gradually changes the temperature of your mattress cover to gently wake you up. It can even provide you sleep and health reports for each side of the bed including sleep stages, sleep time, heart rate, HRV, and you don't have to wear anything. Eight Sleep is the ultimate sleep experience, and it's proven to give you up to 34% more deep sleep per night, and you can stay married doing it. You owe it to yourself and your marriage to at least check out Eight Sleep and learn more. Go to 8sleep.com to read more, learn more, and see if you want to change your sleep and show up better in your life. That's E-I-G-H-T sleep.com slash Deloney or enter promo code Deloney at checkout for up to $400 in savings off an eight sleep bundle. Go check it out. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Kate in Philadelphia. We are born and raised. What's up, Kate? Hey, Dr. John, how are you? We're doing good. How about you? Doing well. Thank awesome. you so much. And just a huge thanks to you guys and your team. I'm really grateful for your show. Thank you. I'm glad that you are in our gang. Man, it's awesome to have you. What's up? Well, I am a little embarrassed, slightly nervous. I have a weird question. Hopefully it's normal, but um, I'm a person who I talk to myself a lot. And most of the time, not most of the time, some of the time it's in my head. Some of the time it's out loud. And I don't really realize I'm doing it until I'm already talking out loud. And it's, it can be embarrassing when I'm around other people and not really realizing it until it's already happening. And so I don't know if that's normal or what I can do <laughs> to help that or, I, you know, I, it's just, it's a thing that happens in my world and was like, ah, I need some help with this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to pull apart here. I, I, I don't, I don't like thinking in terms of, is this normal or not? There's a bell curve, right? There's this idea that given 100 people, 85 of them will do X on a regular basis, semi-regular basis, and seven over here will do this, and eight over here. Will, like, I get that. Um, I like to think of these kind of things more in terms of, uh, I'm assuming that the talk you, you're talking is not nice. Um, yeah, probably not. Okay. Honestly. All right. So if you were just like talking about your grocery list out loud that I can't imagine yeah. that would cause you a lot of stress. 
Yeah, my no. guess is you are pretty mean to yourself, and occasionally you find yourself talking out loud, like, God, you suck, you idiot. Like, right? And you find yourself in a public space, kind of, and people are like, who are you so angry at? Is that more like it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a combination of that, and then it's also, like, moments when I felt embarrassed about something that I did or behavior or, like, conversations that I should have or things that oh, I should have said sweet. and conversations I had with other people, yeah. you know, that type of thing. Yes. So, uh, the uh-huh, rumination. We uh-huh. love it. Yes. Totally. Yeah, if you exactly. just think about it enough, you can actually go back in time and change what happened. So, yes. Keep, I figured keep, that might be keep, the case. Keep so. doing that. All right. So, <laughs> um, I like to think of it instead of, is this normal or not normal, as my body chooses to deal with uncomfortable situations like this. And I would like to teach it a different way of handling it, period. Okay. And one of those is, I can't believe I'm so not normal. This is so weird. And then your body, like just saying that, my shoulders went up around my ears a little bit. And I got Mm -hmm. a little tense saying, I'm not normal. I got to fix this. Versus, Mm -hmm. ah, my body handles stress like this. And I don't like it. And so I want to do something different. One of those is infinitely more compassionate and curiosity driven. And one is more judgmental. You stupid moron. You start in a hole on one of them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Have you ever been diagnosed with um, OCD? Um, No, I've never been formally diagnosed with anything, but it would not surprise me, I guess. Tell me about, tell me about your ruminating thoughts. Yeah. Um, it's a good, it's, it's pretty broad. I kind of ruminate a lot on a lot of different topics, Okay. but, um, I think, you know, uh, if it's, it's kind of acute stressors, right? So if I have a, a negative interaction with someone at work, I do a lot of management of people and personalities. And so if I have a negative interaction at work, I'll kind of ruminate on that conversation and mm. what I could have done better or, you know, just sort of, um, any of any aspect of that. Um, and you know, any, any, any other sort of, I guess, interaction with people or scenarios where I wish I would have done something different. Um, but why, it's, it's, why do you wish you would have yeah. done something different? Where does that, like, I'm trying to drill down to the judgment part. Why do you wish, yeah, that's fair. like when you say mm-hmm. I was, I, it's so embarrassing to who? Yeah. Do people actually comment yeah, to you or no, they no, even notice because they're staring in their own yeah. weird world. That's fair. Um, I think it's, it's, yeah, I think it's mostly my own stuff. I think there's certainly some personalities in my life, um, that, you know, will no matter what sort of have, a, a, their own personal view of me, which I obviously also cannot control, but, yeah, okay. um, you know, I just, I know that they've used me, they view me through a certain lens. Mm-hmm. And so it, I just, it makes me frustrated and, you know, but, um, for the most part, it's just my own self judgment for sure. So um, why don't you like you? Uh, that's a great question. I think I really do like me. There's, okay. you know, Um, I've done a lot of self work and, you know, really spent the last decade or so learning how to love myself. And so that's been great, but it's still, you know, always a work in progress. Um, I think it's just, have you learned to love yourself or have you learned to, um, um, act right? Yeah, I did. There's 100% a factor of that. Um, you know, I definitely know that there's certain ways to be, um, but I think it's a combination of both. Like I said, I think it's still a work in progress for me and that sort of self acceptance in those moments where it's, you know, where I am ruminating and thinking, gosh, I wish I would have done something differently. There's also that quiet, quieter voice, but that's saying, you know, no, you're normal. You're, you're human. Um, everybody messes up or, you know, there's no such thing as perfect. Right. So that, that is a small voice in the head as well, but. All right. I'm going to give you a um, couple of tools that I think can transform your whole life. (laughs) Okay. okay, for real. Yeah. Um, I'm going to write down a quick note to myself. All right. So um, that way I don't forget it. I want okay. you to internalize this with all of your might. Okay. Rumination is a complete and utter waste of your time. Yeah. Okay. So, and so here's the problem. Mm-hmm. Rumination feels like important thinking, helpful thinking. Yeah. Okay. Right? It feels like mm-hmm. we are replaying this thing. And next time we're going to fill in the blank. Right. Problem is we never get to the next time. Right. We get to the what we did wrong, why we suck, why we could have done it better. And then we just park in that just swimming pool of shame. We just sit in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair. So there's a difference between rumination and reflection. Reflection is a critically important part of being a healthy human. 
Mm-hmm. And reflection is simply a, it's got, it, it's this, it's about looking to the past, the good and the bad, likes and dislikes, and then tangibly planning for how things are going to be different in the future. Okay. For instance, like, um, I had a meeting with my boss. I, man, I was awkward. I started stuttering. And then when I started stuttering, I started speaking really fast and I wasn't fully prepared. That was annoying. <laughs> so next time I have a meeting with the boss, I'm going to be very uh, prepared. Okay. That's reflection. Um, rumination is, I can't believe that. He, right now he's sitting at home thinking, I can't believe I hired this freaking moron. I got to find a new person. And, and your body goes to war. It goes to fight or flight. But you know why? Because right. it thinks it's about to get fired. Or it thinks it's about to not have a home or a car or food. And so you start spinning up. I should have said this. I'm going to tell him this thing. You couldn't tell him this thing because you're an idiot. And it's just this. It's a, it's a chorus of voices yelling at you that sound like mm-hmm. one united voice. That's a total, complete waste of your time. Rumination is trying to change something in the past by going over it and over it and over it and over it again. Or it's trying to change something in the future that hasn't even happened yet. Right. It's a waste of time. Uh, it's like, it's practice. Brene Brown calls it dress rehearsing tragedy. Right. So how do you stop it in that moment where you say, when you're trying to be more reflective, reflective as opposed to ruminating when you say, for example, to use your example, you know, I had a bad meeting with my boss and I want to do this differently next time. I'm going to be better prepared next time. How do you like, because when I think through that process, my body then immediately goes into the next step, which is the shame process, you know, all that. And so how do you stop your body in that moment? To just I, I don't think it does. There and let it go. I okay. don't think it does. I think when you sit down and go, man, that was not a good meeting. I wasn't prepared. And you can, I'm going to give you a, the, the ultimate trick here in a second. And it's not a hack okay. but, or a trick, but it is, it's neuroscience and it's magic. Um, okay. But there's a difference between saying that did not go like I wanted it to. I feel bad about how it went. I feel sad. I feel ashamed of how I, I acted in that meeting. That's fair. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I'm going to let my body feel that because that's right. And then I'm going to pull out a piece of paper. I carry a note card with me or I've got my little, mm-hmm. my little journal with me. I'm going to make sure next time I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I make a plan. Okay. And it's very short. And then I'm mm-hmm. moving on. Okay. It's the rumination. It's the when you start creating stories on top of the story. Right. And, well, I wasn't prepared. Well, I can't be prepared if the boss is always making me also do all these other things. And, by the way, Jenny never does her work. And so I've got to do hers, too. So, of course, I don't have time. Now we're in fight or flight. Now your body's pulsing with cortisol and adrenaline. It is not thinking clearly. It is in survival mode. Right. And I feel like it's unstopped. Like, it feels like it's a train that can't be stopped you, when well, it starts, you so know? And it almost it, feels like exactly. I come out of a, a, a daze, right? Like, you I are. wake you up are. afterwards. Yeah. So every, yeah. um, Peter Levine's done some, some really exquisite work on this. That fight or flight is designed to run from a tiger or to fight a tiger mm-hmm. or okay. to try to kill somebody who's stealing your mate, right? Or your child. Yeah. And so right. it pumps your body full of these chemicals. And in our modern world, we just go, <gasps> and then we type an email response, right? Mm-hmm. And so that days yeah. you're talking about is it's biochemical. It's real. Mm-hmm. The only way that I have found to cycle out of it is to go for, I go rucking. I put some weights in a heavy backpack, a go ruck bag and take off down the road. Mm-hmm. Or I go for a walk. I've got some rules now in my personal life. That I don't respond to things while I'm engaged, while I'm mad, while yeah. I'm frustrated. Because yeah. it's, it, I'm yeah. not thinking rationally at all. At all. Yeah. Right? So, yes, that coming out of that daze, you're exactly right. Your body's got to metabolize that stress response. Mm. Oh, that's why every major uh, religion has, uh, uh, or culture has dances as a part of it. Tribal movements as a part of it. Because it, your body knows, hey, mm. we just had a fight or flight situation and we survived. Let's all celebrate this thing together. See what I'm saying? Mm. Thank you. You're yeah. not crazy. Now, I'm going to give you um, something that has been transformative for me, and I want you to read this book. It's by Ethan Cross, K-R-O-S-S, and the book is called Chatter. Okay. And last I looked, he was at University of Michigan. He um, studies that voice in your head that never shuts up. Okay. And it's a tool I took from him that has been transcendent for me. 
And here's the idea. There is a neural pathway for I, for me. And there is a different neural pathway for you, y'all. So think about this. One of your employees comes to you and says, hey, my marriage is falling apart and I did this thing. I don't know what to do next. You very clearly can go, well, Dan, you should fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And your body doesn't get activated. It doesn't run off into the woods. But when you think, I screwed up my marriage. I did this. I'm a piece of whatever. And I, now your body's got to defend itself because it's at war. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So what Dr. Cross suggests is begin talking to yourself in the third person. Hmm. And he gave some examples in the book about, um, you, you hear interviews with athletes and they'll say, like LeBron James will be being interviewed and he'll be like, well, LeBron on that court, LeBron James decides. And I, you know, most of us roll our eyes at that. What he is mm-hmm. suggesting is no, 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 no. That is a different person. That is a, that is a person who takes shots. It's a person who misses shots. That's the kind of person who does this kind of work. So what I've started doing is saying, um, here's a good example. Somebody hit my car while I was in it the other day. A woman was coming Mm -hmm. to her fancy BMW, right? Parked right next to me. I just pulled in. I was meeting my, my wife and daughter for a movie. And this woman opens, we made eye contact as she opened her door and just bammed my car door. And then she kind of like made like a, huh, and got in her car and her husband was with her and a teenage son was with her. And dude, I'm telling you, I was, it was the holidays. I was tired. I've been traveling. I went full DEFCON. I was enraged and I got out of the car and looked at the dent and I looked at her and she rolled down the window and goes, what did I do something? And I said, yes, you hit my car. We both watched you hit my car. And then she goes up and I said, look, and there was a sizable dent, Kate. And she said, I didn't do that. I was distracted. I, I, I was, I was distracted as though, and here's the thing. I was just thinking in my head, just say, sorry. It's a stupid Mm -hmm. car. I don't care. Just say, sorry. And then I happened to glance back and her son is her teenage son. He was big, a big boy, like my size. Mm. And he looked ashamed for his mom. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, I locked the car door and I said to myself, John, just walk away. Because if somebody had come up to me on the street and said, hey, this lady in this car door dings your car and she's hollering, it's about to cause a situation and she's got an embarrassed, I would say, dude, just walk away. It's a dent in your car. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. John, though, wants husband to get out of the car and me and him are going to settle us in the parking lot, right? And I want your insurance and you're replacing my whole door panel. And I had a right to that. I have a legal right to have a new door panel. Mm-hmm. But when I talked to John, I would say, dude, just walk away. Your daughter's in there. Y'all are going to watch a movie together. Y'all have a daddy-daughter date. Go. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And so talking to John, I stay present because I treat right. other people way nicer than I treat myself. Totally. Right? So I want you to practice, Kate, writing these things down. Get them out of your head. Okay. Number one. Number two, you've probably heard me talk about this on the show. Maybe it's been a while. I will often, I don't do it much anymore, but I used to do it all the time. When I was trying to break this bad habit, I would yell in my house, no, real loud. And what Mm -hmm. I was doing was I was stopping the imaginary conversations that I was having all the time. Right. I just stopped. I'm going to break it. I'm going to go, no, as soon as I remember it. As soon as I realize I'm doing this, nope, nope, nope. My wife would just roll her eyes. She would just be like, oh my gosh, my <laughs> husband's talking to himself again. And I would break it. And then I would say to myself, this has no value. Right. None. Yeah, okay. Then, then I would ask myself, do I need to do something different? That's it. And here it is. Your body's simply responding to the stress of your life by replaying things over and over again And ultimately that leaks out into you talking to yourself in some pretty ugly ways. Mm -hmm. And you just have to decide, I want to teach my body a different way of dealing with stress. Right. And I'm going to practice that. And then the third thing I want you to do is start talking to yourself in the third person. Okay. Kate had a conversation with the boss. It didn't go well. Well, Kate, what'd you learn? I need to be more prepared. All right. Next time, Kate, you're going to be more prepared. 
That is such a different conversation than I suck. I screwed it up again. And then when Kate says, but I always mess this up. And you're like, yeah, Kate, you've messed up a bunch, but from now on, you're not going to mess up anymore. And here's what Kate, Kate, here's what we're going to do. You see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah, I do. And I I can't wrap my head around how much, how big of a difference it makes by creating this psychological distance between me and my threat response system. It's pretty profound. I may see if we can get Ethan Cross on the show. I'd love for him. If he's in Nashville, I'd love for him to be on the show. Dr. Cross, if you're here, join the show. That'd be awesome. Um, But that particular piece of his work has been really important for me. Because again, I treat other people so much nicer than I treat myself. So if I start talking to myself with some space, it allows me to make errors. It allows me to be forgiving. It allows me to be curious. John, why'd you just get mad at your eight-year-old daughter? She's eight. Well, because of this and this. Well, maybe you should just not eat that. Maybe you should get some sleep. And maybe you should go tell your daughter you're sorry. That's different than I suck at being a dad and I'm the worst and I... Nah. So try it. Try it. It's 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 neuroscience. It's not just woo-woo. Um, but give it a whirl. Grateful for you, Kate. Call anytime. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Deloney here. Listen, you and me and everybody else on the planet has felt anxious or burned out or chronically stressed at some point. In my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, you'll learn the six daily choices that you can make to get rid of your anxious feelings and be able to better respond to whatever life throws at you so you can build a more peaceful, non-anxious life. Get your copy today at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back. And hey, hopefully you recognize at the beginning of the show, wait, is this the right show? Did I get the wrong podcast? No, we've got new music that was performed and really written by the great Jason Rains, a good friend of ours who's in the band My Weekly Low. And hopefully he's in our band again this year. Although he's pretty good, so he may bail on us. Jason, stay with us. But he's an incredible producer and writer and performer. And um, dude, I'm really grateful that he came up with some tunes. I was like, dude, I want some old school like Limp Biscuit jams with some modern twist. And he was like, I got you. Actually, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> I didn't say that one little bit. Hey, in honor of the great and wonderful Jenna, and her new baby. Kelly, who is the second largest Taylor Swift fan on planet Earth. She actually has Swifty tattooed across the top of her chest, right across her uh, collarbones in Old English. Super awkward when she wears her her, uh, her tank tops, which she wears all the time. But you can just see it, like it just says Swifty across the top. But in honor of Jenna, the number one fan. The song today is called Willow by the great Taylor Swift. And it goes like this. I'm like the water when your ship rolled in that night. Rough on the surface, but you could cut through like a knife. And if it was an open and shut case, I would never would have known from the look on your face. Lost in your current like a priceless wine. The more that you say, the less I know. Wherever you stray, I follow. I'm begging for you to take my hand. Wreck my plans. That's my man. That's actually the exact thing that Kelly wrote to me when she asked to be the producer of this show. And it worked out. Wrecking plans. Love you guys. 